soon, I will repeat my two most important animations. There is still important information to understand about them. This information will really clarify the grand unification of physics. My goal is to make this science film understandable to everyone. However, for a few minutes, I need to cover some advanced topics for the superstring mathematicians. Because in my opinion, this new physics will influence superstring theory. If you do not understand superstrings, don't worry. Please, just keep watching. This will be brief. Lately, the concept of Ricci flow has become very important because it was used to solve a very difficult mathematical problem. A mathematician named Perlman became very famous because he used Ricci flow to create a solution to a famous mathematical problem called the Poincaré conjecture. I can sympathize with you if you don't get this. Unfortunately, within this convoluted idea, the mathematicians have missed something critical. In my opinion, the mathematical concept of Ricci flow is a critical physical limitation. The problem with Ricci flow is that it fails when the necking becomes complete. What do I mean when I say necking? Here's a graphic that shows that. The reason it fails is because Ricci flow only describes the mathematical geometrical manifold. It is only mathematical. It does not take into account the three fundamental physical fields that are in all real solitons. A real physical soliton is made of electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields, and these three fields are located on the opposite sides of the neck. If you are a superstring mathematician, then consider the concept in this graphic. On the left is a spherical wave. This is an actual physical object. It has three physical fields, the electric, the magnetic, and the gravitational fields. The wave has a necking point. On opposite sides of the neck, there are three fields. These fields on the opposite sides of the neck interact with each other. There is a physical interaction. On the right side of this graphic is a blobby shape that represents Ricci flow. It is only a mathematical object. It is a geometrical manifold. It is not a physical object. It, is, it does not have the three physical fields. The opposite sides of the neck do not have any physical interaction of physical fields. When spherical waves travel through a node, there is more than mathematical flow. There is a physical flow. Notice how these fields on the opposite sides of the node are facing each other. These fields are way too close to each other to not interact. There must be an interaction of the fields across the neck at the wave's node. The interaction of the fields has beautiful symmetry. This physical interaction of the field goes way beyond a mathematical interpretation of Ricci flow, beyond the shape of the surface of the geometrical manifold. Ricci flow does not describe the electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields. It relies solely on a mathematical geometrical flow. There is no real physical flow. Superstring mathematicians would like their math to describe solitons in a way that also combines gravity and electromagnetics. When you watch my two key animations, notice how these animations already do this. There's no doubt because my grand unification theory describes these spherical waves in a way that uses the three fundamental physical fields. This goes beyond the mathematical idea of Ricci flow. Call this physical flow, Nordberg flow, or whatever, I don't care. Another related mathematical idea is Poincaré's Harry Ball theorem. I'm not going to summarize this theorem for non-mathematicians. There are adequate descriptions online. The Harry Ball theorem is a logical idea. The Harry Ball the theorem is a geometrical idea. It has minor applications when applied to winds and weather forecasting. However, until now, 
the hairy ball theorem has not been an idea applied to the three fundamental fields in a spherical wave. Mathematicians should take note how the hairy ball theorem perfectly applies to the three fields in, the, in these spherical waves. The two fields on the surface of the spherical wave are first the primary field with its hair sweeping from pole to pole and second the secondary field with its hair counter-rotating around the two hemispheres. The hairy ball theorem even applies to the gravitational field. In my opinion, examining the three fields in a spherical wave is the best possible physical example of Poincaré's hairy ball theorem. Again, this goes beyond a mathematical concept. Spherical electromagnetic waves are the best physical examples of the mathematical hairy ball theorem. Earlier, I mentioned twice, mathematicians need to keep in mind there is something special happening to these fields at each pole and at the equator. Current math might say that the primary field is not continuous or that it vanishes at the poles. Yes, current math might. Current math might say the secondary field is not continuous or that it vanishes at the poles and at the equator, at the nodes and antinodes. Yes, current math might. Yet countless photons fly through space without vanishing and their movement is continuous. In my opinion, these three fields are not separate. They are part of one unified field. In my opinion, what is needed is some kind of elegant new math with a new way to describe not just one of the three fields at a time, but rather all three of them together. When all three fields are viewed together, they do not vanish and they are continuous. In other words, at these special points in the waves, there is no division by zero happening. The elementary particle never shrinks to a zero dynamometer. The three fields do not vanish, they transform. The three fields are really part of one unified field. At any point along the spherical wave, the transformation is continuous and finite. The loop test is an important idea in the study of geometrical manifolds. It is too advanced to explain in depth in this science film. However, let me give you a feel for the idea. First, imagine a sphere. Next, imagine trying to tie a string around the sphere, making a loop. If the loop of string is tightened, it will shrink in size and start slipping off the sphere. I don't have time to explain why this is important for closed geometrical manifolds. However, I must emphasize Mathematicians have been misled by this test. Yes, this test has some importance. Yes, this concept applies to the Poincaré conjecture. However, with regard to physical spherical waves, this is a mathematical concept that does not apply. Yes, a physical loop of string might fall off the pole of the physical sphere. A mathematical loop of string might fall off the node of a mathematical sphere as the loop is tightened. However, that does not happen physically, at least not in the context of these spherical waves, because we are dealing with shrinking loops made up of an electric or a magnetic field. We are not dealing with a real physical string. We are not dealing with a mathematical model of a string. Instead, we are dealing with loops of electromagnetic fields and they have their own distinct physical behavior. Imagine a spherical wave where the electric field is primary. The magnetic loop in the spherical wave would look like this. If this loop is described as slipping off of one sphere, then it immediately slips onto the next sphere. In these spherical waves, yes, the fields pinch down to zero at the poles, at, at the nodes. However, these electromagnetic loops never fall off the wave because they are physically part of the wave. The three fields are part of one unified field. When it appears a loop might fall off of the sphere, it doesn't because the loop of that field is interacting with the other two fields. 
In other words, there's something that is holding the loop in position. The overall wave simply keeps moving as the three fields pivot around each other. As one of the three, field, three fields vanishes at a node, at that point, the energy from the field has transformed into the other two fields. Over the majority of the wave, all three fields exist at the nodes and anti-nodes, while the electric or the magnetic field might vanish, physically there is always some field that has not vanished. Anytime one of the three fields has vanished, the remaining fields can immediately regenerate the field. Further, as far as I can see, within the spherical wave, the gravitational field never vanishes. Normally, it looks as if the electric and magnetic fields are simply transforming back and forth between each other, while the gravitational field is simply changing its direction. So, to recap, the idea that a loop might fall off might make sense for the string test. When a physical string is tightened over some physical sphere, the string test might make sense for a mathematical string on a mathematical sphere, or some other mathematical concept that is sphere-like in some other type of manifold. However, it is improper to apply this idea to the electromagnetic loops that make up the physical spherical wave. Let me mention one final idea for mathematicians to ponder. When two or more of these spherical waves interact as photons, they can combine as standing waves creating an elementary particle, like a neutrino. In essence, when the photons with the correct polarization and wavelength collide in space, the elementary particles may pop into existence. The strong binding force that makes this possible is a spherical combination of the electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields. If I understand this mathematical situation correctly, then, this is the physical explanation for the Yang-Mills theory and the concept of mass gap. Of course, this is not the mathematical description that is needed to compete for your big million dollar prize, the prize for solving this problem. However, this is the information needed to win that prize. In order to win this million dollar prize, this contest is now going to be a contest of speed. Who will take what I'm describing, correctly describe it with the proper impressive mathematics, and publish it first? To summarize, there is an obvious, bigger, and much more important mathematical problem that hasn't yet even been given a name. This simple, physically based, three-dimensional grand unification equation needs to be transformed into an elegant, dynamic mathematical form. These waves must be described in a continuous and finite manner. Then physicists can use this new math to predict stable, partially stable, and resonant forms of elementary particles, to drive the older quantum physics, and to expand on the standard model of particle physics.